Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 125. Revenge of the Sherlockian Nerd. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Oh, Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, that, my friends, is the sound of nerds really getting down. <laughs> and you picked the right place to get down with some Sherlockian nerds, because this is I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees, where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And the only thing we have to say about this is, <laughs> you are in for a treat. If you are a fan of 80s pop culture, of the practice of nerdery of any kind, and especially of the Sherlockian kind, we have your man. We found the guy who transverses nerddom and the Sherlockian world, and that is, of course, Curtis Armstrong. He has a new book out called Revenge of the Nerd, and we're going to talk with him in just a few moments. Now, do you, you think you would categorize yourself as a a nerd outside of the Sherlockian world, Bert? I wouldn't have thought so, but I read Curtis's book, and he is very clear, as you will soon hear, <laughs> about what qualifies one for nerddom. And he says in one of his pages, um, nerds, among other things, subscribe to famous monsters of film land and collect comic books. And he goes into, uh, as you'll see in our conversation, a lot of discussion about his interests, which at one point included memorizing. We didn't talk to him about this, but memorizing the score of the music man and trying <laughs> trying to get his friends together to put on sort of a recreation of this uh, Broadway show. And P.G. Woodhouse and Washington Irving and his love of Dick Van Dyke and Laurel and Hardy. And uh, so as I was reading his book, I realized I share all of those things. So I must be uh, a nerd with a capital N. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll bring it up at the next Sons of the Desert meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you may understand what that means. Uh, and Our if you... wives will never know. <laughs> uh, and if you do understand, welcome to this great brotherhood and sisterhood of nerddom. Uh, well, you know, if you are a true nerd, then that means you'd want to get in touch with us and have your say. You, you'd, you'd want to leave us a comment. You want to get over to IHearOfSherlock.com. And the show notes are available for this episode at iHose.co slash IHose125, all lowercase. That's where you can find links and uh, other supporting documentation for everything you're going to hear. Leave us a comment right there on the site. Send us an email a comment at I hear of Sherlock dot com. Find us along any of the social networks as I hear of Sherlock. And of course, dial us up. Let us hear your nerdy voice in all its glory at 774-221-READ. That's 774-221-7323. And of course, you'll also want to 
get on board the donation train uh, with other <laughs> nerds like yourself. Whether you use and, for, and please, friends, pay for a first class seat on the yes. donation train. First class. Don't you don't want to be an economy? Not on the donation train. No, no, and you certainly don't want to be in a cattle car. Oh, right. That, that's where all the that's where all the bullies throw the nerds. You want you want that first class seat, and you can do that through Patreon dot com slash I hear of Sherlock, or just hit that orange button on our page or the PayPal button. Whatever works for you. We are flexible. I guess we have to have some some level of technological nerdery going on here to make that all possible. But, you know, it's all about you, our listener. And you know who else it's all about? Who? Who? Our friends at Wessex Press. Here in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we're looking forward to Lamas Day, the festival of the first fruits, when we protect the wheat harvest with four parts of a loaf of fresh baked bread placed in the corners of our barns. But you don't need our candlelit procession to find the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library, the exhaustively annotated ten-volume edition of the Holmes Stories by Edgar Award winner Leslie S. Klinger, the best way to master everything there is to know about the great detective and the good doctor. Each illustrated volume bursts with scholarly annotations and features a sturdy signature sewn soft cover binding. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky, and all I ask is a good book and a star to read her by. It's summer, and the perfect source for your good book is wessexpress.com. Choose yours today. Well, you may recognize our guest by a number of names. Miles Dalby, Charles Damar, Herbert Viola, Scooter, or the name that uh, lends itself to the subtitle of his book, Booger. That's right, a legendary comedic second banana to a litany of major stars. Curtis Armstrong is forever cemented in the public imagination as Booger from Revenge of the Nerds. He began his incredible 40-year-plus career on stage, as you'll hear, but he progressed rapidly to film and television, and he was typecast early. But the thing is, it proved to be the best thing that could have happened to him. And there's more to Curtis's story than that. He was born and bred a nerd from right around these parts where I'm broadcasting from, Detroit a city that was so nerdy it actually coined the term in 1950. And then Curtis moved on to sites overseas, not far from Reichenbach Falls. His adolescence and early adulthood were spent primarily between the covers of a book and indulging his nerdy obsessions. It was only when he found his true calling as an actor and un an unintentional nerd icon that he found his true happiness. With whip-smart, self-effacing humor, Armstrong joins us here on the show as well as between the pages of his memoir, Revenge of the Nerd, The Singular Adventures of the Man Who Would Be Booger. Curtis, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Scott and Bert. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. So you've got this book out. Revenge of the Nerd, or The mm -hmm. Singular Adventures of the Man Who Would Be Booger. I, I, I have to start at the beginning here. You know, usually with our guests, we jump right into the Sherlock Holmes questions, but I, I, I think we need to set the stage here. We need to set the tone for our audience. What exactly is a nerd? <laughs> Well, um, my take on it, having given it a lot of thought just in the last few years and, and sort of, sort of collating the ideas that I've gotten from younger nerds, um, I would say that a nerd at, at base is just an enormously passionate person. They have, they have 
uh, interests and uh, you could call them obsessions. Um, and it, they can be across a wide variety of of, uh, of areas. You can have you can obviously have the you know the computer nerd is is the obvious one, which has been around probably the longest. But you know the comic book nerd, the the uh, the book nerd, the cosplay nerd, the uh, I mean, and it, it can get into weird areas that you wouldn't even expect. Like when we were doing our our series, King of the Nerds. Uh, Bobby Carradine and I, and the second season uh, was won by a woman who was a gearhead. She was a total hmm. obsessive about cars and, you know, could sort of field strip cars and uh, this kind of thing. It was just completely improbable and not the sort of thing you would automatically associate with the word nerd. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly broad definition it can include a lot of different things. There are subsets of nerds. So you have the, you know, the, the nerd is sort of an overall description, uh, description, and then you have your geeks, you know, uh, who are, tend to be more specific. So you have like a Star Wars geek, you know, that they, they may not have a lot of other nerd interests, but Star Wars is the big one, or a Harry Potter geek or something, you know, a lot more specific. But then you, I think in general, it's the people with multiple interests that are laser focused uh, tend to be nerds, whatever it is that that interests them, whatever it is that sets them apart from other people. That's what makes a nerd. Well, and you you mentioned uh, the gearhead woman from King of the Nerds. Yeah. Uh, Interestingly enough, you hail from Detroit, and so does the origin of the word nerd. That's correct. Yes, it, uh, nerd was created. Well, actually, technically, nerd was created by Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, <laughs> um, in, I think, 1950, uh, 49. Uh, he wrote a book called If I Ran the Zoo. And he'd created all of these magical creatures for the zoo, and one of them was called a nerd, and it was spelled N-E-R-D. Um, so it was clearly, you know, a made-up word as Dr. Seuss would make them up. Um, but then about three years later, uh, or two years later, there was a thing in Newsweek magazine about about the fact that nerd had become current in Detroit, Michigan, as a descriptive for uh, squares or spazzes, to use the the uh, sort of unfortunate, particularly unfortunate um, expression, but that was that was quoted in Newsweek magazine in about 1950, and then three years later, that was that was when I was born at Harper Hospital in Detroit. So, you know, uh, the one city in America that had already coined. Uh, a phrase that would come to haunt me for the rest of my life. Well, and and clearly it didn't take much for you to embrace it after all that. I mean, no, it didn't. I mean, <laughs> once once I did that, the strange thing was in the sixties, uh, really until early seventies, there was no no real sense of the nerd being anything but a derogatory slang mm. expression. It, it, it was never taken. In any kind, it never had any kind of positive connotation. The word, um, so it was something used against you, and uh, because at that stage nerds were, were still sort of solo people. I mean, they they didn't have communities yet. There was no culture. Uh, it hadn't developed yet. It was beginning, you know, with the the comic book conventions. You know, in very low low uh, uh low energy sort of, of of things it was starting to happen um and then star trek after star trek the original series was canceled um you know it was sort of percolating and then you know in 73 i think i attended my first star trek convention which was in detroit huh. And it wasn't actually called a Star Trek convention. It was called something else, but it was held in a hotel in three meeting rooms. It wasn't even a ballroom. It was meeting rooms. 
and one of them had a 16 millimeter projector and they, you know, they throwing up these, you know, enormous, uh, 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 you know, reels clattering away in this room while people sat there on folding chairs and watched episodes of Star Trek. And then they had another room where, which was sort of what you would call the hawker's room, but it was basically, you know, very little. There was no, there was nothing to support that, that idea yet. Mm. I remember George, they, 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 they had things like George Takei had run for Congress in, <laughs> for state Congress in California. And they oh had a bunch of his posters. So you could buy a poster for, you know, 25 cents or something. It was just unbelievable. And then you went into the next room, and that's where the cast was. Ah. And they had George Takei. They had uh, uh, Walter Koenig and, and Jimmy Doohan. And so, you know, and they're just sitting there. I mean, there's, there's no one oh, there. Amazing. So you could go up and have them sign your stuff and then, and then you would move on and, and, or you could just sit there. I mean, I just stood there <laughs> talking to them and yeah. they had nothing better to do. So they would talk to sure. us, you know, sure. but, but it was a small group. That's the point is that, you know, it was not really taking off properly. Uh, for a while, right. but then once everything started in the mid seventies, late seventies, early eighties, once everything really got together, and and really started to to develop, and you got the the advance of technology and the convention uh, culture, all of that happened around the same time, mm. early early to mid mid eighties, and that's when the nerds sort of embraced the word and used it as a as a, a badge of pride sure sure now interestingly this would have been probably slightly after the time you also discovered that there were gaggles of what we now call sherlockians that were oh yeah around the world but before we get to your interaction with the the subculture that sherlock holmes brings with it why don't you tell us about your first meeting with sherlock holmes well, my first meeting with Sherlock Holmes happened um, in Geneva, in in Geneva, Switzerland. My my family was transferred there. My father worked for Chrysler Corporation, and he was transferred overseas uh, to Geneva. And I was at that point actually nine in 1964. So I go over to to Geneva with my parents, and there's a, at that time. In, Gen in Geneva, there was just nothing you could do much. I mean, there were, you had to be of a certain age to see any movies, really, except Disney movies. Um, kids just weren't allowed in movie theaters. You were looking to go um, to the art house or what? Huh? You were looking to go to art house films or what? No, no, no. I was just going to look to, you know, for, like, for example, the Beatles movie. When the Beatles, when Hard Day's Night was out, I wasn't allowed to go because I wasn't 16. They had these weird laws wow. in Switzerland at the time. So it, there was there was there was almost no television and and so on. So I I fell back very much on music and books, which were my drugs of of choice uh, uh, as a nerd. And hmm. uh, and my father, who had the complete Sherlock Holmes on his shelves, um, one day one autumn day. Uh, took one off the shelf and said, "I think you should. I think you should try Sherlock Holmes because it was, you know, it was one of those things. I don't have anything to read." And um, <laughs> he gave me the Adventure of the Five Orange Pips, which he remembered as his favorite story, which I find really interesting. It's such an odd choice, um, but it is very moody. And, you know, the, starting with that storm, you know, over Baker Street and it, it just it was evocative and and fascinating. And I'd never read anything like it. And I was a reader. You know, I was one of those kids who was reading all of what my my father and my grandfather had been reading at that age. You know, the 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 you know, the Kiplings and the Doyles and the Poes and, the, you know, all that sort of stuff. This was, you know, astonishing, and I finished it, and I then went to Hound of the Baskervilles, 
And then I was just done. And I've basically been rereading them ever since. Uh, but that afternoon, that cold autumn, wet afternoon in, uh, in Chambézy, and I, I can remember the texture of the chair. It is that vivid in my head. Wow. Uh, when I started reading the Sherlock Holmes stories. Never looked back. Now, this is uh, somewhat reminiscent to the humble origins that Michael Deirdre shared with us. It was actually in, in the introduction to his book on Conan Doyle. And yes. uh, for those of you listening along at home, we have Michael Deirdre, Michael Deirdre on uh, episode 38 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We'll have a, a link in the show notes so you can check that out if you haven't heard that show. Um, but that, that kind of visceral notion, you know, Michael uh, talking about his orange crush and hiding under a, uh, a blanket during a thunderstorm, you know, very evocative mm-hmm. of all of our senses as, as we discover yeah. Sherlock Holmes. No, it is, and you know, it, it, it's all sort of mixed in also with with um, you know toast and honey and tea, hmm. because that would be, you know, the snack I would have made myself hmm. uh, at that at that point, and uh, just sitting there and you know having this this uh, this total sensory uh, experience and. And the, the darkness of those two particular books, you know, was, was particularly intriguing for me. Being a horror film fan, uh, classic horror, you know, like the, the Universal Cycles, the first two Universal Cycles, that was my, hmm. one, of, one of my other passions. Um, and there was something that connected that and uh, just the idea of, of, you know, a gigantic spectral hound and I mean, just I, for for someone with a mind of my particular bent uh it, it was it, it was a remarkable thing and in the book i actually have a chapter which deals with the sherlock holmes with my relationship with sherlock holmes uh, uh and the beatles which happened in the same year and and it's interesting to me now uh, that I look back on it and realize the significance of 1964, that those were the two things above everything else. I mean, the, the, the positive things, obviously, um, those are the, the, the things that I, I, I discovered within one calendar year, and they still sustain me to this day. Hmm. Um, there's almost nothing else I can point to that has, that had the same long lasting effect. Mm. And your early connection to Sherlock resulted in your creating a scion society, which you talk about in the book. Well, yeah, not, not really. I didn't have anything to do with the creating of it. That was, it was created by Susan Rice. Yes. Mm. Uh, it was called the trifling monographs. And this was after I'd returned to Detroit from Switzerland. Mm. Um, and, uh, it was about 1969 or 70. And I had discovered the, um, the, uh, annotated, Baring Gould's annotated Sherlock Holmes. And it was, it was there that I first read about the Baker Street Irregulars. And I started, started, there may have been even a, a, an address or something. I, I can't remember exactly how I landed on it, but I wound up subscribing to the Baker Street Journal, I think for the first time in 1970. Mm. And the, uh, the, uh, Cyan, uh, section at the back where it describes what the Cyan groups are doing. Um, one day, one of the issues, this, this group, the trifling monographs, appeared, um, and they were based in Bloomfield Hills, which was mm-hmm. about 15 minutes from where I lived. And I just devoured this. I couldn't believe it, and I got in touch with Susan. And, you know, going back to the whole idea of this book being partially a result of me never throwing anything away, I still have the letter, the note, that Susan Wright Rice wrote me congratulating me on my acceptance into the trifling monographs 
and uh, looking forward to seeing me on such and such a date. I still have the original note that she hand wrote. Um, and that started my relationship with Susan and with, uh, with all of the young, it was a young Sherlockian group. It was, they were all young and, uh, around my age, boys and girls. And, uh, and that became what I did for the next couple of years. You mentioned that your father's favorite story was Five Orange Bibs. Do you have do, today? Uh, do you have a favorite story? I can imagine what it was when you started out, but from today's perspective, do you have a favorite story? From today's perspective, it does change. Mm. But in my most recent rereading, one of the ones that popped out at me um, more than usual. Uh, was the Bruce Partington plans. Mm. Um, but it's, it, these are all things that, you know, again, it's all atmosphere. I mean, it, because it's long past being amazed by anything. <laughs> um, you know, even, even with, even with, the, that was an interesting thing about starting off on, on five orange pips is because, because the, of, of course, you know, spoiler alert, it's it's the Ku Klux Klan, <gasps> and what? as an American boy who lived in a house with newspapers, I knew who the Ku Klux Klan were. So when Holmes says to Watson, "Have you never heard of the Ku Klux Klan?" I was saying, "I've heard of them. I've heard of them." <laughs> it was like I was, you know, waving my hand in class. Um, so, you know, and, and then sort of understanding that that would be something unknown to people who were reading at the time. It was, that was an interesting thing. But the, 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 the best of the, of the stories that, that create, you know, surprises, you know, where you never see it coming. Something like Silver Blaze, you know, who is the murderer of John Straker? And it turns out, well, I'm not going to keep doing that because, you know, of course, anyone listening to this has read these stories. But uh, all that, all of that, um, you know, obviously over time, uh, you stop being amazed at the construction and you only become involved every time in the atmosphere, in the characters, in in the beauty with which it's all done, the amazement of how skillfully it's all accomplished. Mm. And, uh, and that is something that never goes away. So it changes from time to time. It's like my favorite novel for many years was, was Hound of the Baskervilles. My favorite novel right now is uh, Valley of Fear. Uh, mm. The more I read Valley of Fear, the more I realize it's like the beginning of noir, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, that could be done and has been, of course. Um, you know, it's very cinematic and, and, uh, it has that strange mixture of Holmes and Watson in, in this Victorian, uh, uh, era. And then you have this other stuff which feels like, you know, early Hammett or something, uh, the, the, uh, the flashbacks. Hmm. So, uh, it, to me, that's an intriguing, intriguing book, and it's it's become, I think, my favorite of the long stories. Yeah, and and in your early years, you had a, a go at dramatizing some of the canon. Didn't you? Yes, uh, I did. Right. That was my my Orson Welles period. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we know a remote farm in Lincolnshire, where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. <laughs> well, I had this ingenious speech teacher at the same time I was starting to do plays at school and she knew that there was no on some level she just knew there was no point in my doing the assigned speeches because I had all of this other stuff going on and she came to me one day um, and she said you know there's a, a, a radio station in Royal Oak you know very you know it, 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 you know it was sending out a broadcast uh, uh, area well into three blocks, I think, um, <laughs> around the school. And she said, uh, they're looking for students to do original programming. Would you be interested in doing something on there for extra credit? 
And I didn't even have to think twice. I knew what I needed to do was to do the Sherlock Holmes stories, edit them, adapt them, and of course, play all of the roles myself. <laughs> and that's what I did. And so I, every time I had a speech class, I would go home, I would sit with a woolen sack reel-to-reel tape player, and having edited the story ahead of time into 15-minute segments. I mean, it, it would have been completely unintelligible to anybody. I mean, unless you were following it, you know, religiously, because there was never any introduction, there was no idea last week, you know, nothing, nothing. It was just me starting up in the middle of the story, doing all the characters in my own you know, my, my, my Sherlock Holmes voice sounded like Basil Rathbone and my Nigel Bruce was my Watson and everyone else was whatever I was able to do. It, I'm sure it was just cringeworthy listening to, but <laughs> I did a lot of stories and I still have the books that I used to, you know, with all of the pencil marks, you know, crossing out all of the unnecessary stuff to fit it into 15 minutes. Now but you who... You who never throw anything away, you don't still have the tapes? <laughs> I actually came across a <laughs> reel-to-reel tape with the Baker Street Theater on it. <laughs> and I went immediately to a place here in Los Angeles and rented, this was 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and I rented a woolen sack tape player, or a reel-to-reel tape player. So I, cause I thought, oh my God, Eureka, I found... The the only extant <laughs> uh, edition of the Baker Street Theater, and so I got it and played it back. And apparently, someone not me, but someone had found it and taped a lot of garbage over it. So oh. um, it was it was still gone. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I never kept them. I I never remember even thinking oh, I have to keep these hmm. um, because you know you're in high school. Have, have you ever have you ever thought I mean today as an actor you know the interesting thing about the Sherlock Holmes universe is that the characters from the standpoint of an actor are lightly drawn you know there's this precious little backstory but have right. have you ever thought about um you know today uh playing one of these characters uh, in some form not and really which char- you know, a- does any character appeal to you i mean other than obviously Holmes or Watson uh, you know, I, I, I was asked that once before and I don't, uh, I don't think so. Um, I have such vivid, uh, images in my head every time I read these books. Uh, every character appears in the story and I, of course, some of it has to do with the Paget illustrations or the Hutchinson illustrations or someone's that I, 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 yeah, even early on, the editions I had were were illustrated, so part of it is that. And obviously, there's not those those images when you read them in childhood or youth. Those are the, sort of the things that stay with you. At that time, I hadn't seen even the Ratbone Bruce movies. I hadn't seen anything. Sherlock Holmes came to me in a book. I mean, absolutely in a book. And so now, at you know, I've, uh, in, as an adult and having acted my entire adult life, uh, I don't remember a single character who comes up who I think, oh, that happened to me. I should have had that part. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't really imagine what it would be. Let, let, let's come at it from a, a slightly different angle. Then, thinking of the canon in total, to the best of your recollection. Um, who, who's a nerd in the canon? <laughs> oh, uh, I'll tell you right off the bat, Garadeb. Yes! Yeah. Sure. Yes! <laughs> I mean, he calls himself the, the, the Han Sloan of his age, but he's really just a big nerd. <laughs> That's exactly who I would say. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, totally that. Totally. And I think he probably subscribed to Famous Monsters of Filmland, probably. <laughs> he, he what? He probably subscribed to Famous Monsters of Filmland. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the, that's the, you know, there are certain things that we all tended to do, and that was, uh, that was certainly one of them well, for me. Well, and, and you might even say that in The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, Stapleton was masking as a nerd, you know, collecting yes, his, his yes, butterflies. Totally, 
Well, no, I mean, you know, he that may have been. I think they even mentioned the fact that that was actually a hobby. You, okay. You're I mean, right. He was, he, he was evil, but he had a hobby. You know, I mean, just as there, are, I, I, you know, there are certainly good and bad nerds. You are right. Um, and so, so yeah, he would be another one. That's funny. Now I'm now I'm going to be sitting and talking <laughs> to you, and in the back of my head, I'm going to be going, who else? <laughs> I'll well, list them all. Um, hey, friends, if you have your favorite nerd in the canon, you want to write in or call in and let us know, feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Meanwhile, if you'd like to learn more about Curtis's younger days, specifically as a Sherlockian, obviously you've got Revenge of the Nerd that, that chronicles uh, pretty much his whole life. But if you want to really zero in and get nerdy with us um, – Curtis wrote a portion of the 2003 Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual called The Strength and Activity of Youth. Mm-hmm. And it was about the uh, the junior Sherlockian movement. That's still available for purchase on the Baker Street Journal website. We'll have that link uh, to the, to the uh, purchase in the show notes as well. So what about Sherlock Holmes? Was, was he a nerd? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard to imagine somebody who had, you know, you, you have that, the, the, uh, the Watson discussing him, you know, the, when I think it's in Redheaded League where they're sitting around, uh, dinner after with, uh, with Peter Jones and he's going on and on about, you know, uh, uh, you know, warships of the future and and Stradivarius violins and hmm. you know, all that kind of thing. Or when he sits with Watson for over an hour over a bottle of port, telling one story after another about uh, about um, the violinist um, Norman uh, Neruda. Sorry, Norman Neruda, Sarasate. No, uh, no, no. It's the um the famous one uh, n- the famous one supposedly he was like the first, you know, rock and roll sort of guy oh, the Paganini, you mean? sold his soul to the devil for his talent. Uh oh. so you don't I mean I Pag- cannot mean- believe I can't bring his name back. <laughs> it's significant. Uh anyway, uh, he's got all of these, these, you know, deg- I mean, you know, just go through what he what he writes his his uh, his monographs about his trifling I mean, monographs, yeah, as, as big a nerd as you can imagine. That's true. Well, and you even go back to his experiences at university, uh, where he said he was very much uh, a loner. He was a solitary figure. Did obviously did That's not right. fit in with the rest of That's society right. the way they expected it. So, yeah, kind of carved that out. No, it, you're absolutely right. Huh. No, he he. I mean, I was thinking. Uh, characters, but definitely he he sort of leads the world when it comes to all of that. Sure, sure. So you mentioned in um in in one of your oh I think it was it was in Revenge of the Nerds. You mentioned how uh, the actors actually contributed to shaping the script. You all Mm -hmm. each got to inhabit your character, really understand their motivations and how they would have thought about things, what they would have said. And you, you all contributed to, um, you know, how the dialogue turned out. Um, do you, do you, did you think of, as you were writing the book, did you think of any comparison to fan fiction when it, when it comes to that? Uh, Taking a, a, you know, kind of an established work and, and working with it, molding it, shaping it, making your own, going off in different directions. You know, like I don't. I don't think I would say see it exactly as fan fiction. I would see it more as sort of uh, uh, appropriating um, uh, existing characters, um, and that's something that was really important in the case of, of Revenge of the Nerds because the script was so. I mean, it was it was all there. It was the story and the characters were all there, but they were at that point basically cartoon characters. And it was Jeff Canoe, our director, who, who who determined that we really needed to flesh them out hmm. and make them more, 
human and more accessible because if we didn't do that, then the audience wouldn't be invested in it. And that was why they relied on all of us. And we were all older than way older in like Bobby Carradine and I were 31 when we made that movie. So, you know, we were were not exactly um, freshman uh, age. Uh, but everybody, all of the nerds, had substantial film and theater experience, and they and they cast us with the understanding that we we would be able to do this. We'll be able to sit around, and it's hard to imagine a character like Booger. Uh, me looking back on a character like that and thinking, "Boy, you should have seen him before." But really, <laughs> you should have seen him before. It it. it uh, we worked very hard on it for a week, uh, during which time we worked with the writers and the director and just pitched stuff, pitched ideas, pitched character traits, pitched jokes, you know, the whole deal to try to make it, you know, connect. And then when we started filming, we were so comfortable as to who those people were mm. in our own heads that we were able to improvise whole scenes together and it would work. Well, and, Years ago, I recall you mentioning to me as we were talking about the film, because to me, between Risky Business, Better Off Dead, and Revenge of the Nerds, those are like part of my adolescent upbringing. You know, like like they're permanently seared into my DNA. And, right. and, and I'm trying my darndest to have the same thing happen to my boys, but they're a little young yet. <laughs> yeah, they're they're too young for those. Except Better Off Dead. You could show them Better Off Dead. Yeah. Well, no, I think but, we saw that one. We watched that one. And we we also yeah. saw One Crazy Summer. We watched that together. Right. That's um, also, also But you had mentioned way back when that Booger really when you look at him wasn't a nerd. No, I don't think he was. I mean, I uh, I had my own sense that Booger was uh sort of a was a very well-read person. I did that for myself because I had to find some common area. I had to find some way that I could I could feel close to that because everything else about him, the misogyny and the picking of the nose and the belching and all of that kind of thing, it just g- went against my grain yeah. so much. So I had to find in him some little glimmer of something I could relate to. So I made a, an arbitrary decision that he was incredibly well read, but had always hidden it because uh, if he hid it, then people wouldn't think he was a nerd. So he was sort of a, in a way he was sort of a self-loathing nerd. (laughs) And, uh, and then he, he has, you know, all of these attitudes and so on, but then he gets caught, you know, cast out into the outer darkness along with all the other nerds um, and banished to the, to the, to the uh, basketball court. And, um, you know, from that time on, of course, the nerds embrace him immediately. The, the nerds don't judge. They're, they're, they're open and tolerant, and they don't, they don't care whether he is disgusting. They, he's one of them. They all got thrown out together. So I think, in a way, he serves a purpose other than being just the nerds' version of ogre. In a way, yeah, that's, that's he, a good point. You know, he he be, he becomes for the audience. I think on some level that when they see him become, you know, brought into this group of really, truly lovable people, um, and he just becomes one of those people. And by the end, he's standing with them. Um, This is, I think, his his main point of existing is how he made the nerds look in retrospect. Hmm. We've been talking about nerds with Curtis Armstrong. And could there be a better regular publication for Sherlockian nerds like us than the Baker Street Journal? The bookish Christopher Morley assembled like-minded friends, kinsprits, as he called them, individuals who not only cared deeply about and had intimate knowledge of the Sherlock Holmes stories, but who also liked the company of their fellow 1930s-era nerds. When the mid-1940s rolled around, auto executive and fellow nerd Edgar W. Smith brought the Baker Street Journal to life. And ever since then, we've been treated to scholarly and delightful articles about Sherlock Holmes stories. Writings about the writings. The inscription inside the cover of the BSJ reads, See Monumentum Quiris Circumspice, 
which is Latin for, if you seek a monument, look around you. That could easily be referring to Sherlock Holmes, but it also stands for the very people that make up this hobby, our fellow Sherlockian nerds. Get yourself better acquainted and connected to this nerdy pastime by becoming a regular subscriber to the BSJ at BakerStreetJournal.com today. Well, you, um, you know, you've taken us into sort of the backstory of this character. And one of the things you point out in your book that, uh, surprise, surprise, he actually turns out to be a lot like you. Oh, yeah. Well, that was my biography. The, the, <laughs> when I'd gone to the, I'd studied the Academy of Dramatic Art, which was an English acting school, but it had been, it had been uh, sort of transferred to Detroit. And it was sort of an adjunct to Meadowbrook Theater, which, Scott, you know very well. Yeah. And, um, and uh, so one of the things that one of our English act- acting teacher t- teachers told us was uh, the best thing to do, especially in small roles, is to write a detailed biography of your character. It doesn't matter whether anyone knows it. You will know it. And if you know it, then it informs your performance. Hmm. That hmm. was the theory. I did it for years, and all those early movies, I, I would write a, a biography for the character, and I wrote one for Booger. And when I was done, I thought, boy, you know what? <laughs> That's brilliant. I, I can live with this guy now. You know, you, uh, then I, you know, years, years pass, and I find the notebook, and I open it up, and there's Booger's biography. And I am so excited, and I read it, and I realized it really was just me. Mm. It, I mean, it, it, not the belching and the nose picking, but, but, but that idea of putting on a front to cover the fact that you're enormously insecure mm. and uh, that you, know, you, you deny being, being a part of this group until you realize that it's more important that you become part of that group. It was all... It was all Curtis. It, was, it, it wasn't Dudley at all. Hmm. But I never knew that at the time. And, and one of the things I found interesting about your early days at Meadowbrook and at the Academy is that you are the only person that we will probably ever talk to who has been instructed and developed in their profession by Billy the Page from the 1939 right. film The Adventures right. of Sherlock Holmes. So, so talk a little bit about how important Billy turned out to be to you. Well, it, that was amazing. You can, you can only imagine. So I auditioned for the Academy after one year at, at uh, Western Michigan. And I'd, you know, it was very exciting to be accepted to this, to this academy. And the first day we were there, there was an orientation and there were all of these, uh, all of the, the faculty was up, you know, uh, in the, held in the theater and they were all at a table and we, all the new ones, all of us newbies were sitting there very nervous and, and very excited. And people started getting up and doing their talks about what they were teaching and what they was expected of us and so on. And all the time, my eyes keep being drawn to this man who's sitting at the end of the table very quietly, not saying a word. And I know him from somewhere, and I can't imagine where it could be. And uh, finally, he got up to do his his presentation, and he said, uh, yes, my name is Terrence Kilburn. I'm the, and that was all I needed to hear because by that time I, I had been making tape recordings of the Sherlock Holmes movies <laughs> to play in my room. <laughs> I, I, and of course, Terry, even if you see him today, he doesn't look, I mean, he looks like an old Billy. He never <laughs> changed. And at the time he was freakishly unchanged. <laughs> I, by, but I didn't know, I never even listened to what he was talking about. And after the orientation, I went to him directly and I said, excuse me, Mr. Kilburn, but you're Terrence Kilburn, the actor. And it, of course, at that time he was, he was at Meadowbrook theater. He was the artistic director there and he wasn't really acting anymore. And, uh, he said, well, yes, yes, that's right. And then I started babbling and I, <laughs> and basically with Terry, and I last, I, we last had, had uh, dinner together just a few months ago. And, and I, I still babble. 
<laughs> you know, it was just too exciting. Did he have any memories of uh, oh, what probably tons. were a couple of days of yeah, his life? He, he lived. He lived. He was here with his mother. His mother had brought him over from England, and he was living in wherever it was. He was down the road from Nigel Bruce. It must have been in Beverly Hills, mm. and they had a house. And and Willie, as Terry called him, <laughs> and I guess everyone called him. Um, lived right down the street. And he said, I have this wonderful memory of him. Uh, my mother had invited him over, and um, I was waiting for him. And he came down the street, and before I could even see him, I heard his voice, and he was singing some... Be- I, my memory is that when he was telling this story, it was Loch Lomond, but of course, I think I'm mixing it up with... Pursuit to Algiers, um, but but it was some Scottish song that Nigel Bruce was singing at the top of his lungs, and Terry remembers hearing the the singing before ever seeing him round the corner. Um, that was you know one, and of course he wound up having a longer uh, relationship with with Rathbone because hmm. he did the as an adult he did Rathbone's ill fated. Sherlock Holmes play on Broadway. Oh, I didn't know that. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Both, oh, yes. Both oh, performances. That was a, <laughs> that was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's right. Gee, yeah. well, now that now that you mention it, that name comes back. Yeah. Well, 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 well. Hmm. Yeah. And and it, like, there is a there there is a um, there is a uh, Baker Street Christmas Annual. Yes. On, sure. On that on that book. And that's right. Uh, I interviewed Terry for it. I took a, a cassette tape up and uh, did an interview with him about uh, both the the adventures of Sherlock Holmes and uh, his re- and his relationship with Rathbone and the and and the play and uh, and and sent it off and it was used in that. Um, Mm. That uh, Christmas annual. Yeah, there was oh, the have to uh, go back and reread this. 2007 like, Christmas annual. Yeah, but like your um, backstory for for Dudley, who is read more widely, and the great alignment with your own life because you've read widely. Another one of your interests is and, and affections, I believe, is for P.G. Woodhouse. Yes. And yes, in fact, we've seen so. you over the years at the meetings of the Junior Bloodstain, you know, that we had That's during right. the Baker Street weekend. Mm. When did you first cross paths with Woodhouse? Uh, he was another one in, in from Switzerland. Uh, I had two English friends, John and Tom Higgins, who would be in – their parents lived there in our town, and uh, they became my closest friends while I was living in Switzerland, even though – they were at boarding school most of the time, but they would come in for the long, uh, the long breaks. And um, one of them, John, uh, passed uh, very good Jeeves on to me, uh, and it was just you know a Penguin paperback from from uh, the period with the orange cover. And uh, he gave it to me, and he said, "You should read this." He, I think he said something sort of disparaging about you know, getting my nose out of Doyle and read something interesting. Oh. Uh, and uh, so he gave uh, Woodhouse, and uh, it was a similar similar thing of opening it up. I Actually, I was just writing about this, this recently because a friend of mine and I are working on a book right now, which will be, it's, it, to, be uh, to be published privately, um, uh, which is uh, our friendship, which has lasted since high school, um, all of the the uh, the papers that we've written on Woodhouse, with new introductions and sort of connective tissue uh, of all of these things, uh, going back to that that period right up to the present day, and and it's it's you know going back and remembering that you know the feel of the book. Uh, and the smell of the book, and which of course I still have. <laughs> I never gave it back to him. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was another one of those things that was sort of a, it became a lifelong, uh, passion. 
That's wonderful. Well, you know, the next time you're out here in Michigan, um, I, I haven't yet uh, gotten that serious about my uh, P.G. Woodhouse uh, interest, but I was mm-hmm. when I was in Boston, and I know the Pickering Motor Company is out here, and uh, we should pay a visit to yeah. Elliot together. Well, that would be I. Yeah, the Pickering Motor Company um, is a is a thing that actually the 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 the, the president of the Picker, Pickering Motor uh, Company is the guy that I'm writing the book about. That's right, uh, was, Woodhouse is, with. And, is that is that and, Elliot? Uh, is that your friend Elliot? Elliot Milstein, yes. Huh. And uh, he and I, uh, I have never yet attended a Pickering uh, uh, Motor Company uh, a meeting. Um, but you know, if we can work it out one of these days, that would be great. Yeah, we should we should explain to our listeners that, like the Baker Street Irregulars, there are local Scion affiliates of the PG Woodhouse Society, and right. unlike um, you know, Woodhouse wrote so much that the naming has not revolved around particular stories or novels, but around different articles or organizations mentioned in Woodhouse's works. And in right. New York, we have the Broadway Special, and in Detroit, they have the Pickering Motor Company, and all around the world, there are many more right. groups, and there's a very active national convention that comes up in the fall, and it happens all over the world. That's right. Yeah, it's quite quite amazing. I first got my involvement with the NEWT, the New England Woodhouse Thing Gummy Society. Right. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, yes. interestingly enough, it was Ellen Woodger uh, who had... Uh, contacted John Besh and I to help her secure uh, some venues for the national convention, which was, which was happening in Boston that year. Uh, and and I attended the, uh, the the gala dinner, and I never had so much fun throwing rolls all around the dining room as that night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah, like like that Booger. eventually was banned. Um, I they, heard. They, yeah, it, it started I think in in uh, the at the very first meeting in Kalamazoo. <laughs> Someone started throwing rolls, yes. like at the Drones Club, and uh, it became this ridiculous thing that every year it would be. L- I have a, f- I have footage of a dinner <laughs> that Elliot was giving an address at, but it's the whole evening. Somebody filmed it, and it's um, in New York, 1991. Okay, and at one point it looks for all the world like like a swarm of bats <laughs> flying around the room. <laughs> and it's just people started throwing rolls and couldn't control themselves. Yeah. And it, it tended to get a little out of hand. Well, I, and after 1991, they barred, it, barred them finally from uh, mm-hmm. throwing these things around. Well, they, they may have gotten away with it just that one more time in Boston because I remember as we all started in the fun and, and, and people weren't hurling entire rolls they would break a piece off and and hurl it right no and that that was particularly because we wanted enough ammo to last us throughout the entire dinner but ellen got up at the at at, on the dais and and said can everyone please refrain from throwing rolls until the wait staff makes their way through we need to get dinner (laughs) served at which point Someone hurled yeah. a full roll, and it whizzed past her left ear and exploded in in a barrage of breadcrumbs on the wall behind her, and everyone started pelting her at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I remember reading an article. It was actually an introduction to Code of the Worcesters, Worcesters by Alexander Coburn. And Alexander Coburn was, as a as a lifelong Sherlockian, uh, Woodhouseian, he had gotten his love of Woodhouse from his father, Claude Coburn. And he tells a story about when uh, when uh, when Claude Coburn had gone to. It was during the. I mean, it was it was Cold War period, and he went to one of the Soviet countries. I can't remember which one. But even within, you know, the, this post-war bleakness of, of Soviet Europe, they had, you know, this large group of people in this one place that were members of a Woodhouse uh, Cyan group, and they invited Claude Coburn to come. So he goes to the goes to the dinner, and everything is perfectly normal, and and everybody's having a very nice time. And then at one point late in the evening, the MC stands up and and says. 
gentlemen, the bread throw. <laughs> and, then, and everyone stood up at their seats and started pelting each other with whole rolls. And it was like they had gotten the idea that rolls were thrown, mm -hmm. but they didn't really get the idea that what, they were originally supposed to be thrown in order to get other people's attention right. or to irritate them. <laughs> right. You know, you would throw it and then pretend you didn't. Right, right. Uh, and so it became like, you know, right before dessert was the bread throw. Well, yeah, like, like the uh, like a like a pie uh, fight scene in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh boy. Um, now before we, we conclude, we want to get to, uh, an excerpt from the book. Um, you mentioned having a particularly difficult time at a certain point in your career where you had a, a fairly long dry spell, um, almost mm -hmm. a year of unemployment. And this is not atypical, uh, in the acting profession. There are not at all long spells like that. Uh, was there, was there ever any thought during that time or, or since, as Al Holmes sometimes had lags between his cases and how the professions might yeah. be similar. I mean, after all, uh, it was uh, Peter Jones, uh, oh no, Thelney Jones in The Sign of Four who said, you would have made an actor and a rare one, which just right. so happens to be your investiture in the Baker Street Irregulars. That's correct. Yeah, um, I don't know that I... I ever did. I mean, I don't, uh, I, it was, it was a bleak time for a number of reasons. There were also personal things, a divorce and, and so on. So there was a lot of stuff going on at once that was leaving me very unmoored and, uh, and depressed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I think that idea, the, the fact that I sort of went into a period of, of you know a certain degree of self abuse which uh i think that might have been the the sort of only one that felt like a direct connection to to sherlock holmes when he he says uh he says uh, give me give me uh give me work give me you know the most abstruse cryptogram or the mm. most intricate analysis i can with you know do without but uh I, I, you know, the, the, the difficulty was with him, there was a similar thing of too much time without the proper stimulation and you go elsewhere, right? Mm. Um, and that was something which was, you know, that was definitely a part of my life um, during this particular period of time. Um, but it was also a time where I was able to, to you know, uh, in addition to the negative part of it, I was, a, uh, you know, I was also uh, uh, buying and reading books. And, you know, I, it may have been those that saved me, you know, you know in lieu of, of, a, of a, a wife or a, a child. Um, you know, it was something that centered me. Ultimately, mm -hmm. sure. So they've these are the books, not just Holmes or Woodhouse, but many books, um, many authors have been have been important in in keeping me focused and keeping me um, keeping me uh, on the right track, yeah. I guess, yeah. uh, for the lack of a better word. I mean, it's not that that period was something which was unique to its time. It's not something that ever is an issue anymore or has been for many decades now. But but there were times where that was uh, that was a, an issue. And it was for the same reason that it became an issue for Holmes, which is mm. just a lack of work. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, if going from the, the early days, if we, if we can circle around to, uh, you know, the, the title of the book, Revenge of the Nerd, and, and where that came from with with the opportunity to play a role like Booger that you initially turned your nose up at. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I ended a sentence with two prepositions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, speaking of, I'm you a grammar what? nerd. You're going to have to go back and, and redo that. <laughs> right. yeah. We can't have that kind of lack. Uh, yes. Uh, at you which also, you, you also created with... a sentence about Booger that featured the phrase, turn your nose. Uh, up. That's true. <laughs> Very that's good. I, I missed that. You're right. But, you know the the way society has uh changed since then 
uh, the way the way what has changed the way society has changed since then. Oh, society that, has changed. That, yeah, uh, you know, nerd. I, I don't think is is at, at least not a hundred percent anymore uh, an epithet. Uh, it, it is for many a badge of honor. You know, you look at people yes, like is. absolutely Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, nerds of their own right, geeks that That's have. Right. Change the face of how we communicate with each other and gather information. Um, and That's now, absolutely true. Yeah, and and it's. Yeah, it, but I mean, it it, it I, you know, the, it, using them is an excellent is an excellent example. But there's another aspect to it, which is what has happened, and a lot of it is because of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, technology, uh, the 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 fact that um, the internet became possible. And before that, uh, cable television had become possible. Home video had become possible. All of those things contributed to the idea that the nerd culture be- was a, that was a possible thing. The community became possible because of technology, really. And so we look at nerds as the sort of, you know, the technological nerd, the computer nerd, all, you know, those are the classic examples. Mm-hmm. The truth is that all nerds, they could be con nerds. They could be any any other type of nerd. They found each other because of things like conventions and That's the right. internet. That's and right. once you got all of those people together, once you hook them up, you know, from around the world, and you allow them to you know gather all in one place and to meet each other and befriend each other and introduce each other to new things, when that happens on a grand scale, then popular culture becomes an adjunct to nerd popular culture and it used to be the other way around that's right it used to be the nerd culture was the you know the little thing on the side and then there was popular culture right now it's sort of the other way around entirely and so those guys steve jobs and and uh and uh bill gates mark zuckerberg i mean yeah Bill gates yeah yeah. all of of those people those were the ones who made it possible for that to happen in in a lot of but it was (laughs) once they started the ball ball rolling it it you know has gathered steam now to the point where it's it's a huge and and uh and permanent uh, thing, I think. And, and, you know, I think between that and, and between your own work here, uh, and I know you, you'll, you know, more humbly, uh, defer, but you, you have a significant role to play because I think as you've probably gone around and met with these folks at conventions or you know, just oh, shared, time, yeah. shared your own interest that you are, you are a hero to them and, and you've embraced it now. And, uh, oh, totally. Yes. And I, I think, uh, yeah, one, it's been, it's been, Wonderful. I put off going to conventions for a long time. When I started going, that's when I began to realize the effect that that uh, Revenge of the Nerds had on people, specifically that movie. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's been uh, it's been enlightening. I'll tell you. I mean, I knew it was becoming more and more popular and so forth, but I didn't realize the cross generational yeah. influence. But I will say that it was in conjunction. Nerds was 1984. Mm-hmm. So if you go back and look at where all of the, the other elements were coming into play at that time, too. Yeah. And all, so we weren't exactly leading the way, but we were there at the, we were present at the, at the creation. That's right. And, and we were an important part of that, definitely. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that you uh, realize that one <laughs> one might even say that you've reached Nirvana. <laughs> one one might say that. In fact, one did. Hmm. Uh, yes, only only this exactly one though. Right. So let's leave it there. Well, Curtis, I have to say this this has been a treat. I mean, it's always a treat when I get to talk to you, but to be able to share this conversation with our listeners and to specifically concentrate on your book here. I think it's uh, just been a real treat. Well, I, and, and I will say that for me, this has been especially nice because I've been doing a lot of interviews with people and no one <laughs> focuses on this stuff. I mean, you know, the, I mean, revenge of the nerds. Yes, but, but it's been a great joy to me to, to, uh, to be able to talk about the thing in general. And, um, and of course, I always enjoy talking to you anyway. 
Well, so you know, it was great fun. Leave it to a nerd based show to concentrate on something so nerdy as Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, in lieu of a gas light, or an editor's gas lamp, as we actually call it here, um, we thought we would go straight to Curtis to read an excerpt from his book, Revenge of the Nerd. Curtis, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Scott. So this is a, a little section regarding my uh, my childhood in, De- in Detroit with my the Italian side of my family, uh, the D'Amico's. And uh, it just gives you a little idea of the time, I think. From a fairly early age, I was aware of the weird tension at work between the two sides of my family, the Italian immigrant working class side, the D'Amico's, and the executive class side represented by the Armstrongs. It was only when I grew older that I grasped the racial and class hostility between the two families. By the time I had come along, the D'Amico's lived in the east side neighborhood of Harper Woods, just off of Eight Mile Road, in a small post-war house set on an enormous lot, which was taken up with their garden. They grew virtually all their own fruits and vegetables, with Ida making her own sausage, pasta, bread, pizza, and sauces. Dough was always placed to rise in the heavy stoneware bowls on the floor in front of heat registers during the winter, wafting the scent of rising bread throughout their small house. Everything was kneaded by hand, And between the kneading and the gardening, Ida had arms like an Italian communist. She canned and pickled obsessively. There was even a huge grape arbor under which we would sit and eat in the heat of summer and where they harvested grapes for the wine my grandfather made in the basement. To the extent that they socialized, they did so with an organization known as the Loyal Wing Society. This was an all-male Italian social club of which Ovidio was a member. But every now and then, during the summer, the women and children were invited to picnics in a local park in the Italian part of the neighborhood. And it was during these afternoons that I came to understand the importance and, frankly, the otherness of my Italian heritage. The women in floral dresses would sit in groups round the tables, fanning themselves, voluble and full of life. There were the other older women dressed in heavy black, even in the hottest weather, as though in perpetual mourning, looking to me like crows among birds of brighter plumage. The men, meanwhile, in short-sleeved shirts, played bocce, smoking incessantly, everyone speaking Italian. There was a comfort in it and a ritual as well, a sense of timelessness and a kind of security in the knowledge that all was as it had always been and ever would be. That storied white American post-war sense of confidence that we'd gotten through the war and things could only get better from here on extended to working in middle-class Italians as well, though the bitterness of the racism that had motivated my grandfather to ban Italian speech from the home during my mother's and her sister Elise's childhood remained a problem for them. In the summer, I would sit with Ovi on his porch at dusk as he smoked, mostly in silence, watching as the man across the street, a pigeon fancier, released the birds for their evening exercise. They would fly a small flock of them in gentle circles above the street until mysteriously summoned, they would return home. He had a curious habit, this is Ovidio, not the man across the street, of sitting on the toilet with the bathroom door wide open, the light out, smoking cigarettes for long periods of time. At such times, all I could see of him in the darkened bathroom 
was the cigarette's glowing tip. Now, very, very evocative. Really, Thank really you. nice writing. Well, that's the, all of those sections were my favorite, I think, of, of writing in the book. That's wonderful. It's a very nice experience. And, well if you, and thank you for letting me read it. That was really oh, lovely. You're, it's our pleasure. And, and folks, if you'd like to hear about the other side of Curtis's family, the Armstrongs, and what it was like to be Louis Armstrong's grandson. Jeez, friends, sweet friends, where'd you get those beef? <laughs> you have to purchase the book. <laughs> yes, we can't talk about that here. <laughs> Well, you know, it's always nice when we, when we have an author of a piece, and we've done it before, poems and, um, you know, people connected to certain Sherlockians and, and authors of uh, paragraphs that we've, we've read before on the air. It's always nice when you can have them themselves actually deliver it. Yeah. Well, and it's a, you right to point it out as a great example of some fine writing. So it's so wonderful in talking to Curtis to realize that his writing skill is such and his life is of such interest that uh, he was able to pen this manuscript and shepherd it into publication. So I think it was great. Yeah. Now, he's really a great storyteller. I mean, he just he sets the scene so well. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a thrill to know that the excerpt that we asked him to read was one that he really identif identified with personally, uh, that, that it really meant a lot to him as well. But as, as you read the entire book, no matter where he sets you down, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in the, on a stage of Michigan or uh, on the set of Risky Business or behind the scenes at King of the Nerds, he really makes you feel like you're there. You know, and I think Conan Doyle had that talent as well. Uh, just painting a picture, making the setting uh, so evocative, and and not necessarily by you know a, a Dickensian level of detail, as some Victorian writers were known to do, but almost by the absence of certain things and focusing on only those things that are of the utmost importance. It 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 still does a wonderful job of making us feel like we were part of the original story. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, thank you for being part of our original story here on episode 125. Again, if you'd like the show notes, it's available uh, on ihose.co slash ihose125, uh, all lowercase. Uh, let us know if you want to give us some feedback, uh, join the sponsorship lineup, or just speak your mind. We'd be happy to hear from you. And, of course, we thank you for all the support you've given to the show throughout the recent days, weeks, months, and years. I guess now that we're 10 years in, we can say decades as well. Oh, yeah. Did you know we are now in our second decade? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Pretty soon the teenage years are going to come along, and boy, that's going to be cantankerous. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's easy to remember because I don't know about you, but every year and a half I have to change the batteries in my podcast. <laughs> Well, that, that incessant beeping that keeps going off. Yeah. I hate that in the middle of the night. Yeah. Well, kids, let that be a lesson to you. Don't, don't end up like Uncle Bert. <laughs> Change your batteries <laughs> early and often. Right. And in the meantime, before you change your batteries, I will remain Scott Monty. And before you change your mind, I'm still Bert Wilder. <laughs> ah, <laughs> the, the game's afoot! <laughs> You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck. And believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Just to, to uh, put a coda on everything here, um, 
you were thinking about Paganini before. That's who I was thinking. Yes. <laughs> oh, this, this boy, was, that uh, was frustrating. The cardboard box. We I had a pleasant eat. little meal together during which Holmes would talk about nothing but violins, narrating with great exultation how he had purchased his own Stradivarius, which was worth at least 500 guineas at a Jew broker's in Tottenham Court Road for 55 shillings. This led him to... Paganini, and we sat for an hour over a bottle of claret while he told me anecdote after anecdote of that extraordinary man. Now that is a nerd. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. think about it. You and I have been talking for an hour, and he spent an entire hour on the subject of one violinist. Yeah, we and couldn't I even remember actually, his name. You know, I did a little <laughs> background look into who Paganini was and what could possibly have been so fascinating and it is in fact fascinating but he's i mean anybody who does that kind of thing it's like you know it's like us on whatever our passion is you know or it's like you know some guy who talks to you for an hour about george lucas you know i mean it's it's really the same thing yeah and you know this is a guy who had all that other uh, cataloged information in his brain about the history of crime and 140 exactly. varieties of ash and on and on and on. It's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 So. But that was all, that was all the stuff. I just actually wrote an article for, uh, for, uh, Marino Alvarez and Tim Greer hmm. for this book that they're putting together of Sherlock Holmes and education. Ah. And one of the things that I go into there is that, you know, the, the idea of Holmes as professor, as Holmes as the the uh, the head of what you might consider the Sherlock Holmes uh, 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 College of uh, <laughs> Criminal Investigation, That's right. uh, w- w- whatever it is, and how, you know what would be on the syllabus of something like that, mm. and much of it having to do the, the, all of that stuff, which is directly connected. Uh, to what he what he would be doing and what he would be passing on to other people, teaching other people, all of those those forensic subjects. But then, on the other hand, he has an hour worth of stories about Paganini. That's right. And and you know Buddhism of Ceylon and all the other stuff that he, which flies in the face of his statement <laughs> that about the brain not having you know electric uh, elastic walls right you know? right and that for everything the every fact you take in you lose another one he's the best argument against that exactly exactly well so are you with between uh you know woodhouse sherlock holmes harry nelson washington irving we didn't even touch on uh, some of those subjects all right all right all right i'll tell you what to do go that way really fast if something gets in your way Turn. 